a good Sunday to you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend here with us. I want to get right to my guest joining us here at the roundtable today, Jay David Miles. He is a director uh, based in Finley from long ago, spent time out on the West Coast. David, your movie, Good Night Sugar Babe, The Killing of Vera Jo Regal, has grabbed the headlines over the last couple of weeks. Um, you've got a showing coming up Monday night, tomorrow night in North Baltimore. Weeks ago, back on the 16th of October, there was supposed to be a showing in Finley. It didn't happen. Why is there so much, I guess, built up resentment, if you will, against this movie? I don't think it's a resentment against the movie. I think it's a fear uh, of what it, the emotions that it's stirring up. And uh, I also think it's just a mis, you know, it's irrational fears because they just don't understand what's going on. Is there still a lot of emotion wrapped around this case? Two years ago, Vera Jo Regal found murder on railroad tracks right. Uh, right across the Blanchard River. And as you look at this case, you spent how much time going back putting this documentary together? Um, I didn't do two years straight, but it's been a two-year project. And, uh, and, you know, as I explained when I was interviewed by The Courier, you know, that's sort of my method is, is, is I've done true crime stories before, and I mm -hmm. just try to immerse myself. I can't do it any other way. I've just really get in the middle of it. And you play the role of investigator, more yeah. or less. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were some things in the, in the crime itself that were similar to a project I did when I was at Fox out in... Uh, LA I was the story editor for the TV movie division and we did a number of true crime projects and then I became a screenwriter for the same division mm -hmm. and one of the projects that I did was about the capture of the Manson family and uh, people think I'm joking when I make this comparison but there are some similarities between the Brooks family and the Manson family in the way that they they operated and uh, and so that really intrigued me um, when I saw these little you know, comparisons that matched up for me. But what triggered you with this project? I mean, you looked at this case, you saw the media coverage of it. What was it initially, outside of it being your hometown, knowing the, back, the backbone of Finley, the heart of Finley, what was it that triggered you to say, I, I can't let this go? Well, so much of it didn't make sense. You know, you're, 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 you're on, on the, on the, there's, there's layer after layer, and the first thing you see is these two killers, Daniel Bixler and Nicole Peters, these young people that are, it, it almost appears like a thrill kill kind of movie, like, the Richard Starkweather case uh, that became the movie Badlands or, or uh, Oliver Stone's Natural Born Killers. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that kind of a, you know, that's what it looks like when you first look at it. Uh, and then when I started doing interviews, trying to sort that out, everybody kept saying, Sherry did it, Sherry did it. <laughs> and and I, I just had to follow Sherry that. Being the... Sherry being Sherry Brooks, Sugar okay. Babe. She's the Sugar Babe of the title. Yeah. Uh, and that's her nickname. Um, so it really was just, you know, I had no preconceived agenda. I was just following it to where it led me and, mm -hmm. and, and that story behind the story. And that's what's driving all this. I think, well, like I say, these irrational fears and stuff is, is that they think there's a danger from the Brooks family who are still living there in Finley that are, they're going to do something. You look, when you look at this film, uh, the details, some of them, as you said, there are, there's layer upon layer upon layer, but the details are graphic, the details are scary, yeah. um, and, and you actually have crime scene photos. When, when people go out and, and seek out this movie to see, I mean, they're going to be startled by what they yeah. see, the depictions, and you, you don't hold back the reins as far as really immersing people in, as you said, true crime. Uh, the people in the film talk about the crime so casually that you, it you know, almost desensitizes you unless you have that, that image to mm -hmm. bring you back to reality real quick. And so that's really the, the reason why um, that was done. T talk about, you, you've been trying to get this movie shown as, as much as possible. Talk about your motives and, and try, as, as a filmmaker, obviously, it's your work, it's your right. pride. You're trying to get people to understand what you see in it. Um, you went down to Lima. Tell me about that. There was a movie festival. Um, with the film festivals, you apply to it. You don't, they don't tell you you're in until right before it. So it was like three weeks before the Northwest Ohio Independent Film Festival in Lima that we knew we were going to finally be able to kind of premiere this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we scrambled around and we made, sent off to get some DVDs made and, and got ourselves all set up uh, for that. And that really started all everything going. And then the reception there was just overwhelming. They, they had the largest crowd 
ever for a film at that festival was for our, our movie. Uh, won Best Documentary, won the Audience Choice Award. It was nominated for Best Picture, first time a documentary's ever been nominated for the Best Picture Award. Um, so I was, I'm, I'm really indebted to, to Lynn Archibald and the, and the people down there at the festival because they, they gave Vera a voice. Yeah. And, uh, and everything has happened since then. It's started there. As you go from that period moving on, trying to get it at more film festival, festivals, trying to get more uh, views of it, how, how tough has that been? Well, I, I, prior to that, I'd, I had approached some charities in Finley. I wanted to do it for like a domestic violence shelter or, or, or people that, that you know work with with families that are in trouble that way. Um, and they would be interested. I would send them the, the trailer, and then they'd stop returning my emails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a real, you know, it's a it's a graphic story. It's tough to watch, but. You know, my, the way I've described it, people, for, for my own personal doing it, it wasn't fun, but it needed done. As you as you set out to tell this story, do do you as a filmmaker want to leave people in the dark at the end? Do you want to bring them back to some hope? What what do you leave them with? I don't want to ruin the movie. Oh uh, well, that's part of the. You know, I mean, it, it's not a. It's it, there is no happy ending in this, and uh, and it, and one of the most disturbing parts is that the 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 the, the conspiracy behind the, the crime, the people involved were never charged, yeah. except for Nicole Peter. She was originally charged with murder, and then they pleaded her down to conspiracy. So how can you have a conspiracy of one? Right. Where are the rest of the conspirators? She, she said in court who her co-conspirators were. That's in the film. Yet, no charges to her co-conspirators. That's what's disturbing to people, or that's why you know you have some people marching in the streets of Finley and, and down there at the courthouse. Um, that's the justice they're looking for, is that you know they want, if you're not gonna prosecute this, what are you gonna prosecute? It's one of the most horrific crimes. I, I dealt in true crime yeah. for a long time when I was in California looking at a lot of different stories, and I, I can't think of anything as, because they didn't only take Vera's life, they took her humanity. It was a, it was a systematic process for s at least six months prior to her death mm -hmm. of beating her down. And that was another, you, you asked for what was intriguing about this crime, she walked to her own death knowing she was going to die. That's as, uh, that's as compliant. Some of the family. That's as compliant of a victim I've ever seen. Yeah, some of the family talk about the fact that she said she was going on a, she was told to get dressed, go on a walk. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at what was happening to her in the days prior to that of, of the beatings and, you know, and the control that Sherry Brooks, you know, you see in the film that she won't even speak without Sherry telling her to speak. Yeah. She comes out of her room and tell, Sherry tells her to come out of her room. Now she's just going to go on a midnight stroll with these two people that have been beating her all week? Mm -hmm. I didn't buy that. <laughs> do, do you concur with what happened in real life with with the prosecution with the case no, that police see, this is where this is where i don't think they have their minds around what they're dealing with because they who? The, the they the prosecutors in, okay. because they um they built this there was this incident the night of the the they, that they killed her that um some a, a lot of mace got shot off in the house to the point where everybody had to evacuate the house and and air it out and vera had been accused by the brooks family that she had shot, she was the one that shot it off. And Shannon Brooks has asthma, and she went to the hospital claiming to have a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And the prosecution's case is all built around this. This it was like a retaliation that, that that Bixler and Peters got so upset about this miscarriage that they took her to the tracks and killed her for it. And okay. so you know, sort of a crime of passion kind mm -hmm. of thing. Well, that that whole premeditation of taking her to the tracks kind of kills that theory right there. Just just if you look at their actions. But also, the disturbing part to me, as far as what the prosecution case was, is they built it around this incident where the people participating knew Vera didn't do it. She didn't shoot off the mace. And that's where, but they're, they're still saying, oh, they, they, they killed her because she sought off the mace. Yeah. Well, she didn't do it. And, it's, and, and there's a lot of psychology that goes into this, but there's a French psychological term called folie en famille. And it's what it means is crazy family. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a physical family. It can be a family like the Manson family. But we're dealing with some helter-skelter kind of stuff here. We're dealing with a witch craze. And, and they kept saying, uh, they, if you listen to what they were, the, 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 what they were talking to Vera about that whole week, that bitch did this, that bitch did that. Take the B out and replace it with a, with a W. Yeah. 
she was the witch in that house that they were accusing of all these things. And, and, and as the film documents, there's a bunch of accusations that were being leveled at her, and then she was being beaten for that she wasn't doing. She was the witch in their house that they had to eradicate. Does, does your movie set out to say that they are still a threat to the community in which they live? Well, yeah, because sociopaths, you know, it's like a shark that has to feed. They don't. They don't stop. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't. They don't see anything wrong with they, what they've done. People ask, "How did? Why, how did you get the interview with Sherry Brooks?" You know, she's so involved in this. Yet she came forward, and I, what I tried to explain, my, my wife kept telling me, "She'll never talk to you. She'll never talk to you." And I said, "Not only will she talk to me, she wants to talk to me, mm -hmm. because of my experience with the Manson case and having studied sociopaths. They don't feel." anything they've done anything wrong do, do police look at your film as as an opportunity to take this and use it uh for evidentiary purposes i for, for further uh, yeah cases? people keep asking me that and i i you know my my investigation was absolutely completely separate of them mm -hmm. to the point where they didn't even talk to me i made requests for them to to be in the film the detectives involved and and they they didn't actually decline. They just kept sending me to the, oh, you yeah. got to ask the captain, then you got to ask the lieutenant, and it just kind of, <laughs> you know. You uh, could never reach the top so, of the so I, so I never got a yes, and, yeah. uh, and I finally had to start cutting the film. So I just and and we up. wanted to point out we also <laughs> extended our opportunities, uh, possible uh, statements to be sent to us here on the roundtable as far as Finley Police Department, also Hancock County Sheriff's Department. As one door closes, uh, obviously the university not showing your film, another opens showing the film in North Baltimore. Yeah. What has been the reception? Why did they say, yeah, we'll show your film? Um, the, well, a couple things. The, the, the one that really stepped up to the plate was, uh, was Rodney Nelson, the, the president of the Steelworkers Union at, at Cooper Tire. He, he uh, and I was very Where they're also it. showing your film. Yeah, and that was really the first ones to come forward and say, hey, we'll show it. And, uh, and then uh, the one in North Baltimore, because they had the screen available quicker, it's going to show in North Baltimore, and then we're going to show it at the Union Hall. But what I, what I appreciate about the Union guys is that they said, you know, not only will we show it, you can show it as much as you want, mm -hmm. as long as the public wants to see it. Yeah. So what we're trying to set up with the Union is some sort of charity event. If they're going to donate the facility to me, we're going to donate the, fil the film to the community, and then hopefully people who show up will donate Toys. What we're, that's really what we're looking for. We're going to yeah. try and we're going, we're going to try and uh, take them to the various charities of, of domestic violence shelters or something like that, and and you know kind of turn this into a positive. Yeah, as, I, as best you can. Yeah, I mean this this whole thing. I don't, I, I certainly have nothing against the University of Finley, and, and and people keep making a big deal about their decision to cancel on us at the last minute. And believe me, I did not agree with that decision. Mm -hmm. But it was that, that night of the show. It was three hours before we opened the door. Yeah. And they knew about it for two months. Mm -hmm. So that's the part, you know, hey, if you have a problem with this, let me know a little quicker. Than, yeah. <laughs> and we put a lot of effort into that screening and, uh, and to have pulled the rug on us, you know, that, that quickly. But that's aside, I don't want this to become these side issues because there's all this stuff about, you know, the, the way the Voices for Vera people are being treated. Whatever. The focus really needs to be on the murder case. Why weren't charges filed against the what I think, if you watch the film, obvious co-conspirators. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody's asking that question. I, 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 I hear Which you say are the members of the family who are still out. Yeah, well, Zachary Brooks is in prison, but not for the murder. Mm -hmm. He was up for a, a theft charge, and then he also, as part of the murder, um, was uh, got convicted of obstruction of justice and threatening one of the witnesses, uh, this guy named Alan Capp, who, who was very helpful to me. In, uh, in sorting out what happened that night, because mm -hmm. he sort of stumbled into the middle of the story and uh, because he showed up at the house just to hang out a half hour after the murder. Mm -hmm. So his information was really valuable. Uh, and then they got suspicious of him uh, for obvious reasons, and they threatened him, what's, and that's what Zachary's in prison for. It, what's amazing to me as a journalist, and, and tough topics like this, especially when you deal with true crime, is how everybody clams up, typically. Mm -hmm. But you were adamant. You, you said your wife, you said to your wife, sh they want to tell this story. And sure enough, I can't believe the amount of people who opened up to you. Yeah. And, and were you surprised by that at all? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't want to act like, ha-ha, I knew I <laughs> this was going to yeah. happen. No, you lucked I'm out. I'm pinching myself when this is going on, when I'm hearing these things. Because, you know, really, the, you get to the point when they start 
laying all this, this stuff out to you, you start wondering, am I going to get out of this house alive mm -hmm. after what they just told me? And, uh, but it's, it, there's, a, uh, there's a mental illness. Were you in there, there alone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just you and a camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the more I, I processed it, it's, it, there, you know, Sherry Brooks is mentally ill. You know, it's not, and, and that's the, the part that, that people aren't grasping. That they, I, I was asked by the reporter from the Courier, how did you feel after you, you interviewed her? And I was overcome with this real deep sadness mm. because I knew I had to use what she had told me, but I knew, I didn't think it was going to cause as much. But it's all laid out there. As it has, film. but it was going to, it was going to come, going to yeah. blow up. And, uh, and, and it, you know, I don't have a personal vendetta, or, vendetta anything. Yeah. or anything so i felt you know really felt sad because at the bottom line there is no you know it's a very very tragic story well david thank you so much we appreciate it i know it's a tough subject to tackle uh but we appreciate you talking about it and good luck to you and getting your film out there well thanks for having me and i i hope some of this you know all this made sense because it was a very complicated story um you've seen the film so yeah. you know it's it's Hopefully it wasn't too confusing to people yeah, watching your show today. <laughs> definitely. I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a good pickup and definitely, obviously, with the, uh, the, the impact it has on Northwest Ohio and the news coverage here, we've followed the story and seeing it laid out on film is especially uh, disturbing, uh, to say the least. Uh, David, thank you so much. Stay right there. We continue our conversation right after this.